Thank you. Um, well, let me just uh, introduce our Jay media. To my right here, we've got uh, Will Butler Adams, who's Chief Executive of um, Brompton Bicycles, and he's come on one, I think. And he's already asked me if I came on one as well. Unfortunately, I didn't, but I'll not <laughs> that. Uh, Will's very passionate about all things engineering. He's worked for <coughs> Nissan, ICI, DuPont, and Brompton. Um, uh, he um, joined the company in 2002, became a director in 2006, and took over as MD in 2008. And over that period, um, the company has grown from £2 million turnover with 27 staff to one with more than £16 million turnover and 130 staff. Uh, I'm told the company has been trying to perfect its folding bike for over 25 years and continues to do so with the full efforts of its staff. Um, my left here, we're absolutely delighted to have Phil Coochman, who's Chief Executive of DHL Express in the UK and Ireland, overseeing the company's um, strategic development. It manages 4,000 employees and uh, 1,500 vehicles. And he's been with DHL for more than 30 years, starting in air transport with Qantas. Um, joined DHL in the Middle East, uh, worked in countries including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, in London, he set up DHL Aviation, um, brief spell in Hong Kong, uh, became operations manager in Latin America, back to the Middle East uh, as regional director for more than 10 years. And naturally, before his current post, um, he uh, moved to South Africa, responsible for double digit growth in the business there. Welcome, thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, on my left here, last but not least, um, let me introduce Leslie Batchelor, who's Director General of the Institute of Export, a champion, a charity which is uh, which champions UK exports, established in 1935. Um, Leslie uh, was appointed Director General in 2010 after a three-year uh, elected tenure as Chairman and CEO. Uh, she's active on the APPG's advisory panel on trade and investment and gives evidence to the Hasseldorf Select Committee on government support for SMEs. She's very much a marketing, intellectual property and licensing expert. Um, brought together various organizations to create Guru Online. Uh, worked for many blue chip companies um, and set up CMC Marketing in the 1990s to devise strategies and training programs for SMEs. So welcome. Um, now, um, before perhaps we get into your questions and into the nitty gritty of kind of things that <coughs> companies might do. I'm going to ask what, what some might see as a kind of uh, everybody, uh, what some might see as a slightly cynical journalist question, which is um, is is the is the enthusiasm we're seeing for exporting emerging now, is, is that going to survive a recovery? Because some people will say that the prior to the um, prior to the financial crisis. Um, it was too easy for many companies. They could, they could get by quite comfortably <coughs> growing in the domestic market. There wasn't such a reason to think of exporting. But since then, that's been much more difficult. I've lost count of the number of companies I've talked to who've said, well, the UK market's very flat, so we've been growing the exports, and often by double-digit percentages annually. But um, if we do get, and we do, it does look like we're starting to get a more broad-based kind of recovery here. If we do get a recovery in the domestic economy, uh, well, is there danger they're going to take their foot off the pedal? I think maybe I might I'll start with Leslie on that one. You see, meet a lot of uh, meet a lot of exporters. You get to... um, I, I think it's quite interesting because uh, obviously we started talking about uh, international trade and growing our exports uh, a few years ago when it, we first realised this is going ha going to happen. Uh, exporting is very complex if you're not going to the European Union. What you are going to do is need to find out a lot about a, com a new country and a new market. And you really are looking about sort of 12 months to 18 months before you're going to start seeing results. And I actually think that what we're seeing now is the result of a lot of planning and a lot of activity that's been going on going into those new and very much more complex markets that, rather than the EU. Phil? Um, yeah, I, 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 a word of caution, if you will, but um, let me come back to that. We've seen, as we've all heard this, we've seen huge growth. Um, DHL has seen huge growth through DHL's customers, mainly um, inspired by online. So on, online sales we know is huge. So in our business, broadly speaking, what we've, we've seen over the last couple of years, something like 40, 50% growth in 
um, the shipments that are sent out by companies who ship who have an online activity, the more um, the the uh, the more conventional industries, if if you like, it's much less. It's it's probably those exports are probably less than less than t than um, than ten percent. The um, and actually destinations. I need. I, I, um, I mentioned the big growth ones at the moment, and for probably for the last two years, Australia, USA, um, and then places like Ukraine and so forth. But we, a word of caution, in as much as companies tend to think when they're going to start exporting, they're going to, we're going to get into the BRIC countries. Now the BRIC countries are actually certainly the hardest, um, procedurally and customs and all and all that. Um, so, we see the greatest success in a company who wants to begin to export by, firstly, it'll start with probably B2C, directly to, directly to, the, um, to the customer in the, in the foreign country, but the successes come when they start at the easier countries. And the, the best place to start, obviously, is, um, um, well, they start nationally, and then the next best place to start is Europe. And then the English-speaking countries, so hence Australia, um, uh, US, we see successes there. And when they kind of get their feet wet, they, they then, the pattern seems to be then that they'll expand into those more, difficult, those more difficult markets, but very appealing ones, of course. And if you can crack China, you've, you know, you've probably got it made. Um, but as Nick said, Nick said earlier, it's a tough one. Russia's another tough one. Everybody wants to go there, but the, um, the doors are not quite open yet. Um, but I think that's the big prize. The big, the big prize will be, will be certainly China and, um, and, 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 and Russia, Russia as well, actually. I'm interested in those online companies. The, uh, obviously, the, that, that's a big opportunity. And on the face of it, you think, well, that must be easier, mustn't it? Because you don't need to get this great network. You've just got a website and you can just send it out to them. Do they face particular... What, what do they need to think about? Well, hence the need to, to think about which markets they're going to go to. And so yeah, if yeah. Big, I don't know about Brompton, but the, the, uh, some very big successes are um, um, peers of, of his, uh, um, Chain Reaction in um, mm -hmm. Northern, Northern Ireland and Wiggle, oh, yeah. they... Um, th 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 these guys really have a big surge, and um, you know, and that traffic and their biggest markets actually are, are, are Australia. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the fashion industry, net is another is another very big one. Sports Direct is huge, and you know, and these these companies are, you know, finding finding um, ways to tap the easier markets. Quite frankly, if you can if if we could help them find ways to get into the other, the other two or three big ones, um, there'd, be, there'd be no looking back. But there's some fantastic success stories out there. Will, you've been uh, growing exports rapidly during uh, what's been a pretty difficult period for the global economy and the UK economy. What have you been doing? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not entirely sure I agree with what, with, our, with what our first two speakers have said in our experience. I think um, export is a bit like sort of getting into a marginally cold swimming pool. Uh, you have to take a sort of draw of breath, leap in, and it's pretty Baltic for about the first two minutes. Then you start swimming around and actually it warms up and you're having a wild time and it's great. So I think once people do it, they actually realise it isn't difficult. If you are... We, we, we have distributors in 44 territories around the world. Um, we are the distributor in a number of those territories. So where, as an SME, well, we've come through that, we've, um, where we're dealing with Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Thailand, it's so easy. You, 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 they just turn up and pick it out your door, and they worry about all the, 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 the paperwork and all that stuff, and, 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 and you just get the dosh. And if you do pro forma, then you don't get, they don't even pick it up until, it doesn't even leave your door until the money's cleared into your account. Um, so that's not so tricky. Once you start doing business in somewhere like America yourself, then you have to worry about the import and ticking the right boxes and remembering which category it is, and that's a bit of a pain, but because you haven't done it before. But it, it, for SMEs, if you've got a cool product that's unusual, there are loads of people. You turn up at a show, um, you're surrounded by people who think your product's good, 
Um, they all know how to distribute and import stuff. They've been doing it for years, and you get started. And, and it's, partic it's low risk. Uh, for me, businesses just need to get on a plane and go out there and meet people, meet people in their industry. Um, and if they can get a bit of help from the government with UKTI and, and therefore make it even lower risk because it's hardly costing them anything, um, it's, 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 it's actually, actually not difficult at all. I, I really think that is one of the problems. We think it's difficult, but it isn't. So I think once people have been forced into doing it, they're going to go, well, this is a no-brainer. I've ticked off three countries. You know, once you've got them set, set up, you just pile into the rest. Leslie? Uh, well, I just really wanted to take a, a small issue with some of the things you're saying because I think you have a fabulous product and I really do and I think it's a very popular thing. I think what we tend to work with are companies that are uh, in a me too range, a lot more of a me too range. So these companies are going to have to think very carefully because they don't have the money to invest in just popping out and having a stab at something and what we're trying to do is help them to actually get it right so when they do go out to a new market they actually get the benefits of actually understanding how to sell it out there understanding the legal imp implications of what they're doing because actually unfortunately we don't all have a Brompton bike which is a great you know it's a great product some people are dealing in markets where they're having to compete on service all the time. They're having to compete with people where they're making exactly the same product. So they're having to find some way of differentiating themselves. And I think this is where, you know, the Institute, we help people by just giving them the basics of how all of these things work and giving them the context in which to operate in. So I appreciate what you're saying. If you work with distributors, and yes, get out there and have a go, but I actually believe we should be embedding international trade into our young people and actually getting them to think about it as an option instead of, you know, having to say, like, oh, it's, it's, uh, just have a stab at it because it's just, you know, it's a, great, it's a great opportunity when you've got a great product. Unfortunately, we're not all in that circumstance. But, but, but what I, I, I'm no expert, and, and you, you are, but um, so clearly I'm coming at it from a slight sort of myopic view, but... Um, there just seem to be a monstrous amount of British companies who export nothing, and nothing. They just they just UK focused, and they're whizzing around and they're charging around. SMEs employ 12 people. You know the idea of exporting is just mind-boggling. No chance, can't do that. You know, oh, we're too busy, and oh God, we're charging around. You know, firefighting everywhere. Um, I, 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 it's not fair to say Brompton was like that when I joined, but 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 we was plenty of sort of myopic firefighting going on. My feeling is, you know. Just, at the very least, get on a bloody plane, go somewhere, go to a trade show with nothing to lose and just see and meet people, chat to people, find out, and, 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 and you, it gives you the confidence. And then once you think, God, this can't be so difficult, then you realise UKTI exists. It's there for free. You guys exist. It, all the advice is there. But half these people, they haven't even gone outside the car park. And they just need to get out there and, and have a crack at it. The rest will follow. They're not idiots. And the advice is there. They only just have to peep their head above the parapet. And there's, there's all the good advice will come. But the first step is leap in and have a crack. And then the other stuff will come. Oh? Yeah, two things. One to your question, one about SMEs. On the question, I hope we don't take our foot off the pedal. Um, with a recovery, because I think we'll be a bunch of numpties if we do that. We're actually going to be issuing an invitation for people to come and eat our lunch, because that would just be looking at the British economy on its own, and we actually have to see us in a competitive context, that there's a load of people out there want to eat our lunch, and they've been doing well and are continuing to do well, like Germany, while we've been having a bit of a doldrums. South Korea, my own industry, South Korea 10 years ago, had no defence export industry, probably 50 to 100 million bucks a year. I think I'm right in saying last year they did 5 billion. They've had a real determined effort by industry and government to get into it. So we'd be a bunch of numpties if we just sit back, take our foot off the pedal and let other people come into our market. On the SMEs, I completely agree with what you said about get out there. I think the only, th the only qualification I say is it can be expensive. Mm -hmm. And this came to me when I, when I was on the, in the government for a while in uh, what was Defence Export Services, then in MOD, now in UKTI. Um, I came across this small uh, cloth military clothing company, the Singapore Air Show in, like, in about 2000, uh, 2003. Husband and wife, they'd spent their entire annual marketing budget of five grand on two airfares, a dreadful little stand about this wide, and were living in the grottiest B&B I'd ever had described to me. 
And they actually didn't need to be there because they could actually have gone to the UK TI section, the defence section, the commercial attaché, asked all the questions they need to know about how do I sell military clothing into Singapore? How do I get an order? How do I get paid? What bonds do I need? Blah, blah, blah. And it was there. So we set up a small business unit, which I think is still going today, has about 1,000 SME members who get helped, firstly in this country, but then do exactly what you said, just get out there and do it. And that's why my... At the end of my presentation, I just said, just go and do it. I completely agree with you. It's not as difficult as it looks. I don't think you can lose sight of the fact, though, that you can't just go everywhere. You know, um, you know we've spoken to potential um, exporters of various, various products and various qualities of the, of the products, and they've come unstuck. They see, oh, South Africa looks like a good market because they don't have that product down there. Mm. I've lived in South, in South Africa, and... Um, it's tricky, they're, they're, and, and, and some of these people are totally ignorant of the pitfalls that, that, that they're about to encounter with, you know, th things like duty, that they, simple things like duty, which they, which they didn't anticipate, you know. So, so um, um, I, th I don't think it's as easy as jumping on a plane and flitting off around everywhere. I think you've got to be very selective and you've got to be very judicious in what you do and what your product is and where it's likely to fly. And, um, but, but equally, I'm so impressed with the, um, what's available in UKTI and, you know, the, you know, the wealth of that website, which really should direct any, any aspiring ex exporter to the, to the right place and to get the, to get the right kind of advice to keep, um, uh, you know, to keep their feet on the ground. I, mean, I think there are three reasons, um, Brian, why what you fear won't happen. One is because we've had this protracted period of um, uh, recession. A lot more companies are trying the export space. When they've succeeded, they will realise, as Will says, that it is not as difficult as it appears. Contracts will be there. The, the, the relationships will be there. And why would you drop them once you've got them? Um, secondly, I think what we're seeing is a huge amount more inward investment into this country. You know, huge Chinese companies, Indian companies coming, uh, 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 adapting here. Uh, British companies are getting into their supply chains. That gives them opportunities in those markets. And thirdly, I think you know, the nature of what a company uh, is, is changing. When I go down to our sort of tech city um, uh, um, uh, project in, East Europe, in, 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 in the East End of London, I mean, a, a new company is two kids and a laptop. That's what it is. Um, and they're producing... Um, uh, uh, services which never leave the internet space. They're producing services which manage data in different ways, for example. Um, they're producing animations, computer science. It's just as easy. You know, they barely know where their um, customers are. They, you know, it's just as easy for their customers to be uh, in China as it is to be in uh, the UK. And, and the more uh, companies of that kind we have, the bigger a proportion of our economy that becomes, uh, uh, the, the more they will be utterly comfortable in the export space. I guess my concern is not so much with those <coughs> who've put in the effort and the investment in the last couple, two or three years, because they, they, they've done that. They're not going to suddenly row back from that. They, they know it takes years to, to build that kind of thing. It's just whether um, the, the drive to get SMEs who've never thought about it before. Um, and, they, and, and it is getting through. I, I mean, several now have said that they've had, a bit, they've had talks, a bit of help from UKTI, and they hadn't heard of them before or weren't, thought they weren't on the radar, or thought it was for big companies, not for them. That definitely is getting through. Is whether, whether they, the, 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 the next tier of companies you're trying to get to, is whether they might think, you know, take the foot off the pedal a bit if their domestic markets are improving. <coughs> I, you know, I, I, I think there will be companies of that kind, but I just think that they will be a much smaller proportion than they've been in the past. And, you know, I, I do think the point you know, underlying what you said uh, uh, is absolutely right. There's a big issue for us, and indeed for others who provide um, uh, export support, uh, that companies really need to know what exists. You know, the, the, the general issue for us is that when people um, use our services, they find them very good and very... Um, uh, 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 cheap at the price, as it were. In many cases, they're free, um, but not enough people know about it. So we need to do a lot of work, a lot more work, to ensure uh, that they do. And we're going to be doing a big um, uh, above-the-line advertising campaign of our services this autumn. But we're, we also work uh, with uh, SMEs, trusted advisors, so with banks, um, accountants, with lawyers, to make sure that in their conversations with businesses, they're talking about 
um, uh, our services, and I think that is a very important part of it. And actually working much more closely with the other organisations which are in the export space is also very important, like the Institute of Exporters, like the Chambers uh, Movement, like the trade associations, because you know, one thing which I think is a key um, uh, comparative disadvantage for UK SMEs compared to uh, German SMEs is if you are a German SME and you want to export, you know exactly where you go. You go to your local chamber. They do everything for you. They're a one-stop shop. That doesn't exist in the UK. It isn't our culture. So we have to, as organisations uh, who support exports, have to get to a situation where, to the customer, uh, it appears that there is a one-stop shop, that there is one place for them to come to. And we work so closely together, um, and the lines between us are not um, uh, visible to, to the customer, that all the different services that you need in order to support uh, an exporter are there, available very simply through a single shop window. Thank you. I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to see if there's anybody from the audience would like to um, ask a question. Uh, yeah, and if you tell us your name <coughs> and where you're from. Okay. George Whitehead from Oxford Investments. Uh, I'm involved in venture capital investing. That's a few million at a time. Into, so sometimes the guys with a laptop who are fast growing. Um, uh, a lot of the time we've found the companies that have really thrived have done so partly off their own bat, but then partly through partnering with larger corporates. And sometimes it's very scary to work with larger corporates, but this has been how it's helped them really get into the exporting to help with the distribution and uh, and the sort of global growth so the question is really passed to you on the corporate side to say what are you doing to make it easier for SMEs to work with you to help help uh, work on both sides and then from UKTI export side of things to talk about what you're doing to change the culture in corporates to make them much more welcoming to SMEs Good question. Let's start, let's start with yeah. Alan. Being, I mean, I'm interested in SMEs where they can help us get into new markets, mm -hmm. have new technologies and things like that. Um, we've put a huge amount of money in the last three or four years into getting into cyber space and cyber protection. And it's a, it's a hugely growing area for in generally the market. And we've done that by acquiring companies. And um, we're also interested in working with companies who we can bolt on and use it as a new market entry. So for me, I'm going to see people I never saw before. I used to go and see defence ministers and military chiefs. We now go and see interior ministers and things like that. So I think where people can give corporates market access, where they can really add to the sort of um, the shopping bag that you're bringing to people, um, from my perspective, it's a real value add. Think to deal with big companies at all? It's not something. It's it's. I, I like to try and come up with something for pretty much every question, but in this case, it is not relevant to our company. So I'm going to pass the ball straight on. You obviously do. Lots of yeah, lots I, of customers. Well, the, sort of uh, kind of along the along the same lines. What I am finding with some of our larger our larger customers and our, and our and our exporters. Who want to again? Who want to tap those tricky those tricky markets, if you will? So take a um, let's give an example, and they won't mind me talking about. It. Take it. Take it. Aneta Porte. They want to expand in um, China. And they want to get there. They don't really know quite quite how to how to get there. So the next step is to is to start a distribution centre in Hong Kong and start from there, and then move into and then move into Shanghai. This this type of thing. The the, the, it, the, the problem is with them and companies like them, there's a lot of guesswork involved and there's no model. Mm -hmm. So when they go f from the basic model, which is a B2C direct to, the, to, the, to whoever orders it on the, on, online, to a bigger model where they need, a dist a, they need an agent or they need a distributor and they, or they need a DC somewhere in some other, other, other country, nobody, nobody has a model. Um, and there are all sorts of different trial and error at attempts at things. And I think that that may be, that's, that's an area where somewhere, if a, if a connection were made and alignment with corporate finance, with, um, um, with a, a, a body, if you will, who can assist in that kind of thing. It's very, very fragmented. The, I, I find the exporters up there, as, as they progress, the will is absolutely there for the bigger guys. And, this is where you've got to kind of segment it between the small SMEs, and then the, then they get bigger and bigger, and then they become then they they, they become um, um, large exporters. But 
the, 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 the models for the, and the segmentation of it is very, 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 very indistinct. So there must be, um, you know, there must be an opportunity for the, for, for the investor uh, and, 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 and the consultancy business in this, in, in the, 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 this whole challenge. Leslie? I, I think if, I, if I've understood you correctly, um, you know, one of the things that we do is we try and help people, uh, smaller businesses especially, to learn how to negotiate. And I think one of the things that happens when you start working with a huge corporate is that you don't negotiate, they tell you what the terms are going to be, uh, and then you have to decide. And what I think it, it, you know, is, um, is very difficult to understand sometimes is the complexities of that. Um, and I find that is one of the things that disappoints the smaller businesses as they're, as they're growing and as they're trying to grow. Uh, one of the things we're doing at the moment is we're working with Nissan, and as uh, um, Alan said earlier, the car industry is actually a superb example of how well we're doing and is how they're doing with supply chain support as well. And one of the things they do at Nissan is they, they engage with all of their supply chain to make sure that they bring them on board. So recently they've brought in a lot of new customs initiatives that are actually going to mean that they're much more cost effective and much more aggressive in the marketplace. You know, one of the things I hadn't understood about Nissan in particular is they're a great manufacturing unit, but they're also great at managing the whole process. They understand about when to keep things in a warehouse and when to withdraw it and do all these fancy things. And actually, they don't have contingencies and sort of slush funds for when they make mistakes because they really don't make that many mistakes. And that's the sort of thing that you've got to embed into the small businesses to take them up to the stage to working with the corporates. Uh, and it's a big job. Uh, whether that will ever change, I'm not quite sure. Nick? So it's a really big focus for us, and I strongly agree with you. This is a, a hugely important thing, getting SMEs into export markets, because it addresses that risk um, uh, aversion issue. Um, so I'd just say three things. One is we work very closely with big companies to big British companies to get um, uh, uh, companies in their supply chain in the UK into uh, international markets. So JCB and Diageo, for example, we work very closely with on that. In, in the energy side, um, in, you know, to give you one example, with BG and BP, we're working very closely with them in Kazakhstan to bring some of their Aberdeen oil and gas supply chain companies there. In fact, the Kazakhs want to establish an Aberdeen on the Caspian, um, getting uh, some of their companies there. Recently, we took a delegation of uh, media, digital media companies to pitch into Universal in uh, Los Angeles, and that was very successful. So that's one area. The second is... Uh, around foreign primes. Um, uh, as I mentioned in my speech, we work with Huawei uh, and lead um, joint missions um, into China of uh, smaller companies and their supply chain in the UK into China. And it's done not on a, a, a company basis, it's done on a corporate responsibility build links between China and UK basis. So these missions are about enabling them to pitch into other uh, Chinese companies as well. With Tata, we, we, we have a number of their <coughs> supply chain companies here um, attending um, uh, uh, their academy in India to learn more about how to uh, do business in India. Um, we work with some of the big European uh, 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 constructors like Vinci, for example, and we take um, groups of companies to pitch into their procurement organisation to look at their opportunities in their countries. And the third thing, not quite the same, but um, important nonetheless. Um, we're working with uh, the big banks um, and the big accountants internationally uh, around a program called British Business Centres, which are essentially soft uh, uh, landing spaces for companies looking to establish in particular markets where they can have office space uh, for free, um, and this is serviced office space, uh, wh which is also a place where um, people will be able to advertise their local services, you know, local <coughs> accountants, local property, uh, office rental, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, how to operate in this market. And we're putting those in the offices of large banks and accountants overseas. We recently opened one um, in HSBC's office in Warsaw, uh, for example. So those are the kinds of things. And, and I do think we're tapping into something there because I think you know, big companies uh, really do recognise their kind of responsibility to help 
um, uh, SMEs succeed internationally. And not only their responsibility, their real interest, um, their own interest in making that happen successfully. Thanks very much. Um, we've got another question over here and then one here. We have a mic, if you just wait on for a second. Be... Uh, my name's Andy Gent. I'm from a, a small company called Revector. Um, I've exported to over 80 countries in five years with a very small team and no distribution. Um, first of all, I'd like to just try and clarify. Um, we're talking a lot about big businesses, big corporates, which work in a totally different way to companies like Brompt and myself, where we go out there and do things and get things moving. Um, we've got innovative products, but there's also companies who, of a small level, cannot have, like Alan said, 20 offices in, in 20 countries with translation and everything else. So really my, my question is, what is the audience here? Is it split between corporate players and small companies like ourselves? Or is it um, all corporates? Um, can I just ask that question for an ANS of, or do you want to ask that? How many people in here are small corporates <laughs> against you know, people like Will, who's come from 2 million to 16 million? Or are they all billion companies? Um, because the government obviously wants to push SMEs, mm -hmm. um, but it needs a, a kickstart in some way. And um, what, what do you think that kickstart should be? Um, well, I, I, I've come from a corporate world 10 years ago to a new world where I'm using you know, new tools and everything that I've learned all my life. Um, it's using the internet. I've got contracts in Russia. I've never been there. Um, I've got contracts in um, weird places around the world. I don't even know where they are. Um, and it's all been done over the internet. It's done by networking. It's done by social media. It's done by the new things. Um, in the corporate world where I've had a contract with, let's say, a very large UK mobile company, I've ended up with a 64-page legal agreement, which I've just, um, just said yes to and ignored it all. Whereas in other countries, I get a two-page from Russia, I get paid, it's all good, it's all in the modern world. So it's, it's getting people to use the modern technologies, but it's also understanding the differential between the you know, X billion deals in one country and the 100,000 deals in another country, you know, for a small business. So one of my things is, is it is like Will said, is actually get up, go out there and do it, or phone somebody up and do it and just push forward and use initiatives. It's how does the UK TI start to help small companies drive those initiatives, I think. And when you were doing that, did you have the kind of help you thought you ought to get? I didn't, I didn't know about it, so I just did it. Um, and then the only help I've used, and I have used at UK TDI, is to just sponsor some exhibitions at relevant places and get some um, funds back. But most of it has been all my own risk in doing that. Um, and then finding out about things, as, um, as Will said, you know, just get out there and do it. Well, what's your experience on that? Um, it's, it, I mean, the way, the way we operate our business, and I, I, just to correct, because it's bugging me, um, we, we're probably going to do 28 million this year, so the stats are a little <laughs> bit oh. wrong. So we, we, just, we just moved on a little bit since then. <laughs> we're now about 220 staff. But, um, but we, um, we, we, we have a business ethos where we're not that interested in the upside. There is, seems to be a, a, a business uh, fanaticism of justifying investments. What is the payback? What is the up to upside? How long will it take to pay back your investment? Um, that is not our philosophy at all. If you employ somebody, and most people you employ are half decent because they tend to be rather better at the job than you, which is why you've employed them. They come with something in their brain. Um, and they're going to come up with an idea. And they're not going to come up with an idea that they think is stupid unless you're very poor at recruiting people. Um, so all we think about is not really the upside, because if you say to them it has to be a three-year payback, amazingly they'll come up with this fantastic proposal that is a three-year payback. Oh, amazing. Wow, we must do that then. Um, so we just look at the downside. If it all goes completely tits up, what's it going to cost us? What are we in for? What's the flight out there? You know, you're 5,000 quid for your two flights and staying, you know, can we afford it? Um, and obviously you've got to prioritise, but that is where we 
go in terms of our business. We, we, we don't spend too much time um, going into the nth degree. We'll try and get as many freebies as we can. We'll try and use our initiative, and I, I know what you mean in terms of contracts. If I spend all my time reading all these contracts I'm signing, I, I, I would just give up. And our lawyer's a complete rip-off, so we don't like to talk to him. Um, so half the time, if it's a big company, we just sign it on the basis that it's a big company, they've probably spent millions of pounds on their lawyers, therefore, and they don't want to get done in. I mean, that's fine if it's the UK, but the, the approach is different. But the, for me, it is about protecting the downside. And as you say, we are in a much more uh, privileged position because we are in a position to, to say, you can't have our product unless the stuff's cleared in the bank. There are lots of companies that don't have that position. But I, I think, for me, the challenge is not the big corporates, as you say. It is that for UKTI to find ways in which you get businesses with less than 20 people to see something that's there and by and large free and to get them to just do one trip. Do I mean, of course, they're not just going to go to some place that's totally irrelevant. They're not that stupid. They're going to go somewhere that has some connotations with their product and they will, if they're not, you know, they're going to go to a show or something. But if you just get them to do it once, and this is the trick for you take KTI and the government, they need to get more businesses doing that. I mean, just to add to that, the other thing that does our head in is tax. You know, we're trying to create products in different territories. We've got a free trade agreement with Chile and we've got a fruitcake um, running Argentina. And so trying to get anything in Argentina is completely bonkers and it's extremely expensive. And then, of course, in Chile, it, it, it isn't and, and it's a free trade agreement. Then we've got South Korea, which is a great market for us. Free trade agreement has been phenomenal. But it did give us a bit of trouble with Japan, which is also a mature market, because then, of course, the Japanese were worried that everybody was hopping over to South Korea, picking up a few bromis and then taking them back to Japan. So, you know, th I think tax is something that as your business gets rather more global and in a world where the internet is so powerful, the customer doesn't understand tax and it causes us quite a lot of trouble. So, so, well, 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 you, so you're describing a situation where you've got agents and distributors yep. and so forth. Um, what, what if any proportion of your business just goes direct to, you, direct to the buyer? Zero. Because, that, <clears throat> because you see, that's where we're seeing enormous um, and easy exporting for loads of companies just like, just like yours. <coughs> yep. Great websites, all that fancy stuff on the website, and, and, and they order it and boom and away it goes. So duties paid at, at origin, um, the, the customer at the other end doesn't have to bother about duty, doesn't have to bother about anything like that, and we deliver it to, to in, in, in the tens of thousands of, of bicycles of, um, uh, of any any other product you care to mention, particularly in the fashion and 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 and, and the retail retail. So, I, I guess you know you've, you've got your own model and it's obviously very successful. But the other one, and I think particularly for anybody any exporter that's starting off, um, you can avoid all that. You don't actually have to go there. You can do you can you, you know you can find ways to do it absolutely virtually, and you can deliver it direct to direct to that. Consumer in another part of the world, and you and you know and, and you know and you're taking market share from the high street in Sydney, not from not from anybody anybody here. And it, but it's easy. B to C. When it comes to Nick and me, I'm going to ask Leslie first. What do you, how, how do you think smaller companies see it in your experience? What well, going out to a new market? Mm. Um, uh, I think the only thing I would say is I agree wholeheartedly. You've got to go to a trade mission, a trade uh, exhibition because it gives you a great idea of what's going on. And even if you're not going to export, I think actually going and visiting gives you great ideas about what's going on internationally and, and how they operate, you know, and you get out there and you, you get a feel for what the global market rather than just the UK. And I do think we've got to stop just thinking about the UK as being our only market. You know, I think we've got to, as a nation, stop thinking in such a, um, I think somebody called it myopic way. Um, I think we've got to start thinking about it, but I would like to see just a little bit of preparation because we've known companies come to us and they say, oh, we're going out on a trade mission to Brazil. And you think, like, oh, great. And they go like, and they come back and they say, wow, the taxation was huge out there. The import duties were huge. We can't export there, but we'll have to set up a, a, a manufacturing unit. Could have saved themselves a lot of trouble 
just a very quick phone call, just a very quick piece of research on the internet. Let's face it, nowadays you can get all sorts of information there. Let's just, I just want to try and embed the, the awareness of, as, as Will says, the taxation system and how it might impact on their pricing. Just think about how they're going to collect the money. If you're not lucky enough to get advance payments, is there going to be a cost to it? I just want a few basic questions. And even our business studies don't cover, you know, where our kids are coming out with business um, studies, A-levels and what have you. They don't just ask a few simple questions about how you're going to trade internationally. It's about getting that basic embedded idea of internationalizing. We are a great trading nation and we forgot that we were a great trading nation and I think what we've got to do is get back into that and small businesses uh, just got to have a, a, a quick think about what they're doing that's all. I think you'll reach out to smaller companies what are they saying to you? Yeah you know I, I absolutely agree with Will and with the question that that's where the focus has to be um, over the next period. As I said in my opening remarks you know, our biggest companies are as successful as anybody's overseas. Um, yes, we of course need to work a lot with them because there's a lot more we can do in that space. But the real comparative issue, um, UK as against um, uh, you know, our European competitors, is the performance of our SMEs in, in those markets. And that's what we have to address. Um, you know, I'd really encourage all SMEs to look at um, UKTI as, as a way of them getting on the cheap um, a, uh, a complete global network, a global network of the scale of a very large company. We have teams in 100 markets. These are not civil servants. These are people who we employ locally, uh, who've worked in the private sector, who have specific uh, sectoral expertise. And the stuff we do for companies um, is either heavily subsidised or free or actually helps them. So you know, the, the question I mentioned, our TAP programme of uh, being subsidised to present at trade exhibitions overseas. Um, we provide heavily discounted market research reports, reports which will identify, um, uh, or rather business matching, so which will I identify distributors, joint venture partners uh, for you, trade missions, business development visits where uh, we will pay you to go out to a market to uh, meet with people who are potential customers. Uh, trade missions, we do hundreds uh, ev every year from the Prime Minister down. Um, and for small companies, these are done up very, very low cost. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it absolutely is uh, the key focus uh, of our organisation that we have to. You know, that's why we, we've set the 100,000 extra uh, companies. I think those will be SMEs. Um, you know, that's where we have to focus over the next period. Thanks much. We had uh, another question here. Uh, wait a second, the mic will be coming. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Um, John Tebbit from the Construction Products Association. We've actually got a project with UKTI on um, how to identify the small SMEs, the small SMEs within our sector who don't even look at exports at all. So we're three months into that. Those are the ones who just press delete on the email button when the UKTI comes up. Um, I would like to support what um, Alan said about um, he who owns the IP owns the high ground. And what we've had over the past couple of years is a UK standards envoy um, in the Middle East spending time trying to reconvert their building codes and standards back from the Americans, which happened during the last 10 years or so of the previous government when we didn't visit our old friends and trying to convert it back to UK and European standards because for some sectors like ours, those codes and standards are the single biggest barrier to export. And if you don't have those in, the, in, the, in place, you can forget it. You know, your fire door is completely different if it's an American fire door from a, from a British fire door. Uh, but the, the, the question was about these HVOs. We did a lot of work with the ODA on the Olympics about breaking down that nine billion pounds into bite-sized chunks of different things. And some of those projects last for 10 years. And so how do you see breaking down these HVOs, which are mega, they're five to 10 years, they're beyond the capacity of any one company. How do we break them down? Because the, the pieces that interest different SMEs are often quite small, Imagine the signage for Crossrail. It's way down on the procurement guy's list. 
but for some SME, that's probably a couple of hundred grand, possibly a million. How do you break it down, both value, who to go to, when to go to them? Because there's a huge investment that's needed, and that's not going to come from the SMEs. And for a trade association of 10 people, even though we have 40 billion turnover, can't work that one out, um, where does that come? And, and any ideas would be very gratefully received. I think probably Nick is the yeah, they only can really answer that one. Could you explain to us what the HBOs are as well? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. So the uh, HBOs, high value opportunities as we describe them, are essentially around 100 uh, major uh, global projects where we believe there is significant accessible uh, value to the UK. So some of these are major infrastructure projects like Mumbai to Bangalore Industrial Corridor, huge energy projects we're doing. Uh, you know, a vast project in Brazil with Petrobras, some of the deep oil that they've identified. Um, big uh, sectoral uh, projects, so as I mentioned in my opening remarks, in Saudi Arabia we're working with the Saudis to um, reform their health system on an NHS model with a, a significant private sector uh, element to it. Uh, education, um, where for example we're working uh, on a massive um, uh, online education project with the uh, Chinese. Um, you're absolutely right that you know, the, these are vast medium-term projects which will be developed in chunks. You know, and the, key, the, the key point and you know, what we're trying to do by really focusing down on these, focusing our attention on, on these, is to, is to build real knowledge of how those pro, uh, projects are managed um, and um, uh, who the procurers are and build really strong relationships with them so that we have early information of how those projects are going to procure. Um, and then to working particularly with you know, yourselves and others um, to understand um, as well as we can the landscape in the UK of the sorts of companies who would match to that. And then we bring those two things together. And we do it in a, uh, an integrated way. So wherever we can, um, we are going after you know, particular chunks of a, uh, uh, of, of a product in an um, integrated way. So you know, this part of the, um, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of the major project, we are, where we, wherever we can, identifying the prime the supply chain companies that could be involved, um, those who could provide the services into that company, and competing collectively, because that's what our customer tells us. The, the procurers overseas tell us the Germans do that very well, the French do that very well, we should do it in that way. So that's what we're trying to do. Great, thanks. Aaron else have a question for us? Adam? The microphone is coming over here. <laughs> thanks, it's uh, Adam Marshall from the British Chambers of Commerce. Um, we've heard a lot about two of the important channels to support SME exporters today. That's bigger corporates and, of course, government. Um, but I was wondering if the panel had some comment on a potential third channel, which of course is SMEs supporting each other. And they do a huge amount of that um, through networks like Chambers of Commerce. Uh, that's why we're working with Nick and colleagues to build up the capacity of British Chambers in overseas markets so that when you get into a market, you can actually have support from other SMEs. And I just wonder from the various experiences that people have had, whether SMEs in fact are the best evangelists for other SMEs to be exporting. Yeah, let's start with um, Will on that one. Do you um, do you work with other um, other SME, other companies of your size? Um, I think yes is the answer. Um, it, 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 once you um, get into this world of um, your head above the parapet, there is so much support, advice. Um, I mean, universities. You know that there are just endless opportunities that are really extremely good value for supporting your business, um, and in fact, you you get to a point where you've got too much of this support. So I think um, once you're in that world, that there's plenty to have, and there's plenty of support, and you network with loads of people, and you turn up to events like this, and you know you, you're off and you go to the trade shows and you get to know all the other international players and it's all a little family and you're off. It's, it comes back to the problem for the Chambers and for the UKTI, is just getting these people who are not exporting. It's, you know, it's like what we say, it's, once you're in it's easy, it's relatively easy 
you know, but you've got to, it's getting these people in, out of their businesses. Just give up one day and, you know, so I think that's something that probably um, we don't have time for as a business. I, I don't think we're going out and doing that per se. Um, if one of our customers asked us or one of our suppliers asked us, we might help them, but we're not out there doing that. That's something that you guys, you guys are better at doing. Um, but, but yeah, once you're, once you're in, in this world, you're, you're, you're just surrounded with it all. I mean, I, I just can't keep up with the free advice and sensible people who've been there before giving us help. Leslie, to what extent do you think SMEs can support each other? Um, well, well, I think, obviously, I think moral support is great. And I, I, I think I've personally, you know, met somebody on the, on the plane and they've explained to me that they're going to see a certain distributor or somebody who's really good in that market. And it's great, you know, it's really useful to be able to do that. I don't know whether you could rely on it for to build a whole strategy for your business exactly. Um, I'm not quite sure. And I, you know, obviously free advice is free and sometimes you get what you pay for. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's very mixed. That's the only issue I'd have over it. Um, obviously, it's great that moral support, though, I think is hugely important and sharing experiences and things like, you know, you know there's parts of certain cities are, are dangerous and certain parts that are really great to go to and certain exhibitions are better than others. That sort of, you know, collective information is really useful. And I think it's really more a question of how we draw from that rather than you know, just leave everybody to their own devices. Just to, but, just to butt in, one thing that I didn't mention, which is probably relevant, um, we went through a, a, sh a sort of beauty parade on the, ba the banking, because like all little companies, you know, you, you, you end up with some bank and then, you know, you're too busy to worry about it. And then we, they all started flirting with us. So we, we don't actually have any debt, so it wasn't like we were after an enormous loan. And the bank that we had was actually doing a perfectly fine job in terms of just doing the banking, the money coming in and out. So where was the value? And the value wasn't in the banking because, I mean, it was just so easy. They can all do that, put the card in and everything else. Actually, the value was in the bank being a business support to us. We've, um, we've, we've ended up changing bank. We changed to HSBC, um, and that was pr partly because we set up, we, we opened a shop in Shanghai. Therefore, we, ha we had to set up a, a wholly owned subsidiary in Hong Kong then we set up a, a joint venture in Hong Kong, then a wholly owned subsidiary of the joint venture in um, Shanghai. And, you know, the bank operates in that part of the world. It's been bloody useful, introduced us to a lawyer. You know, so there are other ways in yeah. which you can get this advice. Um, and it was pretty handy. And again, you know, they're busy spending time and money giving us this free advice mm -hmm. and introducing us to people that they know uh, we can trust. So it's another route. Mm -hmm. I thought I could, Adam. If you, if the Chambers, chambers for example, could set up um, forums somehow to get people and the one that always comes to mind is the uh, is the uh, online fashion online re online retail industry both domestic and e and exporting and um, as I said earlier there's a load of different models you know and all of them so Marks and Spencer's next net a porto farfetch matches it goes on and on and there's a great long tail of small um, entrepreneurial fashion online ex exporters who really want to who who who, who were growing and, and um, really really see opportunities there. But the, the, the models that they have for, for pricing, for charging or not charging for transport, for example, of duty paid at origin, duty paid at destination, um, and, 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 um, and their, their ideas and plans for DCs later on outside of, um, you know, out, outside of the UK. There's, there's this enormous disparity between, between them all. And I imagine that the, um, particularly the smaller players would benefit if they were found themselves in a neutral forum chaired, chaired by a body such as yours to, to learn from the big boys. And, um, you know, perhaps the big boys would start to rationalise the way that, the, and, and, and simplify the way that they, they, think, they, they do things. Thanks. I'm going, to, um, I'm going to ask a big picture question again now. I'm going to come to Alan first. It's about growth prospects and where the best growth prospects for Britain's exporters now lie. Until recently, it was a fairly simple story. They certainly didn't lie at home. Uh, growth was, was non-existent in the Eurozone, very slow in the States. And the message was, we need to be in the BRICS and the next 10. It's all emerging markets. It's getting a bit more complicated now. It's the, um, the, 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 some of the emerging markets have been slowing down. There's been the currency crisis. 
Uh, the American economy is picking up pretty smartly, and there are signs that the eurozone is starting to pick up. How do you, how do you see the picture? In, in my sector, it's really easy, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's, it's about the Middle East and it's about the Far East, North and Southeast Asia. And uh, Europe, Europe is largely flatlining at the moment in terms of U.S. defense expenditure. It's uh, going down a bit at the moment. Latin America is sort of stable, but the two growth areas are Middle East, particularly the Gulf states and South and Northeast Asia. Um, we have uh, taken a lot of action. We've refocused our export effort. We've put managing directors into Abu Dhabi, Kuala Lumpur and Tokyo. We've expanded our network of offices so that we can capitalize on that because the growth there is exponential. So, um, sorry to give you a, perhaps not the answer you're expecting, but we, it's really easy for us. We're absolutely focused on these two regions and we'll, I, I foresee we'll continue to be in that position uh, over the next five to 10 years. Well, what's it look like for you? Is it changing the pattern? It's, um, I think, in answer to your question, holistically, it depends on your product yes. and mm -hmm. where you are in the, in, in, the, in the journey. We've had tremendous growth in, in Spain. I think we touched on this earlier. You know, and everyone, well, Spain's finished and it's all in doldrums, which of course it is. But we only had 10 shops selling our bike. We've now got 120 shops selling our bike. Well, if the market off the 10 shops has dropped by 20%, we've now got 120 shops, we can afford the 10% drop and we're still, you know, doing lots more sales. So, the I, you know, you, you've got to go with, with where you are in this, with your market, your distribution. But um, it's what, what we have to do as a business is focus on extracting the best value, um, whether that's innovating in new products or whether that's focusing on export. Um, we, we tend to believe with our product it's a bit of a slow burn. So we'll go into a territory, not put a huge amount of effort in to start with, um, build relationships, see how people take to our product. It's a bit weird and counterintuitive, um, and it takes a bit of time to get hold. So we are focused on um, Asia and America as sort of two markets that we're putting a lot of effort into, opening up an office in America and an office in Asia. And they are mature markets that we could do a lot better in by doing a much better job. And then we've got the, slight, the slow burn is China, where you know, it might take five or ten years to get going. But we're sort of, you know, we're putting effort in because we're in it for the long term. So it's, you know, but the, but, but the potential is huge. And, you know, we just don't have the capacity to do it all at once. The world is, is, is small, but it's also very big. There's tons of people out there want British products. Um, okay. Uh, so, DHL in the UK, we are way and above market leader in Express. So, we move a higher volume of shipments than anybody else in, in and outbound from the UK. And it's true to say that we're a bit of, we can be a bit of a bellwether of what's, what's with, with, without being immodest, it, it's with a, a bellwether of, what, of, what, of, what, of what's to come. So, for example, two years ago, we saw a load of growth between um, uh, all the Asian, com all the Asian uh, countries and the, and the UK in, in shipments. And it was kind of before it, be it, 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 it was headlines, really. Um, what we're seeing now is we're seeing very strong growth between here and the US in, bo in, in, both, in both directions. Um, a bit of a slowdown in, in China, but then again, that tends to be tends to be seasonal. I think we, we everybody got every, every all, everybody got affected by um, the, the by the downturn there uh, uh, in the last in the last few months. But so, but a shift a shift away from 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 Europe. But then I must qualify that as well because as as Will says, we see um, um, you know pockets in in the, in the big European markets. You know in. In, in Germany, France, and Italy, and 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 Spain, um, but we'd say there's a shift. Um, uh, it, 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 there's indications of a shift away from away from Europe and for, uh, to where, where our customers are exporting to. Okay, everyone else. Well, I agree with Will totally. It depends on your product because some products are needed and wanted out there and some people, you know, it depends as the, as the Chinese and the uh, Indian middle class grows, they're going to become, become more and more uh, important to us as manufacturers and, and I think it's very much about what you're selling and where, where the opportunity is for you. 
Nick. Are you yeah, I agree with that. I, I, don't, I think we have to be flexible. I don't think there's a single answer to where we need to focus. So, you know, I haven't spoken much about the European Union, but, you know, uh, of course we've had growth problems, but, you know, if you've got the right product, I mean, Jaguar Land Rover have double-digit growth in the European Union because they have the right product. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, just because there's some slowing down of growth in some of the uh, big emerging markets, um, uh, 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 take that too badly because, you know, it's sustainable. This will, this will continue. So China, I was yesterday having lunch with Chairman Ye uh, Wang of Wanda, who's the richest man in China. And um, Wanda are currently sort of investing hugely heavily in the UK. They've just bought Sunseeker. They've just um, invested in One Nine Elms next to the Battersea Power Station. We were introducing them to retailers, and they're building shopping malls. They already have shopping malls in 95 um, Chinese um, cities, all of which have more than a million people, many, many more than a, a million people, and they want British companies to present in those shopping malls, and they are doing this at a vast pace. Um, and, you know, just such, such opportunities. But the, the one area which I do think is, is really worth, particularly SMEs, focusing on are those high growth, um, particularly Asian markets, which are quite developed. So the Singapore's, the Hong Kong's, the South Korea's, the Taiwan's, they're pretty relatively easy to do business in, often springboards actually as well into more challenging um, Asian markets, but their growth is very sustainable. Do we have another question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hang on a second, Howard. there's a microphone coming around. <laughs> Um, good morning, uh, um, Howard Wilden. Uh, I, I speak, I suppose, as an independent uh, in support of uh, chunks of industry, uh, particularly defence and aerospace, but my question is wider than that. Uh, we look at the title there, defend, <coughs> Driving UK Exports. Well, of course, Driving UK Exports today, and we've had some very, very interesting comments uh, all around, driving them tomorrow will be about how we drive research and development today. Now, accepting, uh, accepting that uh, financing yep. is very, very tough for, for SMEs, I mean, how are we actually going to, uh, going to do that? And secondly, are we putting enough effort into facilitating for uh, SMEs? In other words, are we putting them in touch with the right people, with the right experts? You know, we, we try, but I don't think we're doing uh, anything uh, large enough by comparison to what our, our competitors in Germany and elsewhere are doing. Who wants to pick that one up first? Nick? So I think um, uh, I really, I strongly agree with uh, you know, the building the research base, and that is at the heart of um, Vince Cable's industrial strategy. I mean, that is about you know, really strengthening R&D um, uh, support in this country um, and bringing together universities, companies, the government to do that, and uh, you know, a number of catapult centres are being established around you know, particular uh, technologies. It's also about developing uh, the right skills uh, in, 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 in this country, and that's very important, particularly to support uh, you know, a growth back of uh, manufacturing. Um, and thirdly, and it kind of picks up a point you made at the beginning, uh, Brian, which is about you know, really focusing on industries and developing uh, the supply chains there. So um, as, as Alan mentioned um, in his opening remarks, the automotive industry, which was a disaster, as we all know, in the 1970s, has grown back and is more successful than it's ever been. And that's partly off the back of big foreign investors coming in here as primes, but it's also because the supply chain has grown back. It's not full, but uh, it, it, it is much, much fuller. We need to look, which is what Vince is very focused on, at the, at the other sectors in our uh, country and grow back those supply chains. And that's vital uh, in the export space because, uh, as you mentioned, Brian, you know, that is a core reason why you know, when sterling went down, we didn't have uh, significant uh, increase in exports um, off, off the back of that because you know, we have a very high import component in our exports because we import um, to then reassemble. Um, building back those supply chains um, is absolutely critical to the sustainability of our economy going forward. Alan, I think I guess there's no difficulty of BAE doing a lot of research and development, but um, do the companies you deal with, um, your, your suppliers and customers, do they... Um, do they um, doing what they need to do? Mm. Yeah, I think by and large they are, because in our sector, as Howard well knows, you die if you don't invest. And um, 
I use the phrase for people wanting to eat your lunch. I mean, our industry, like every other, is like that. And we face very strong international competition, particularly from uh, other US companies, French, Italian, German, uh, primarily. And so you have to stay at the forefront. And I think we are always on the lookout for niche companies, niche technologies that can uh, interest us. And as I said earlier, not only benefit our current products and services, but expand us into new areas where people have new requirements. You know, we're not arrogant enough to think we have every solution to everybody's needs. So I think for us, particularly given the job I do, I see them as opportunities to expand our business base and use SMEs for that basis. Whether they're investing enough, I don't know. I don't have visibility of that. But I think there's an awful lot of SMEs out there that are investing hugely in this sector. And I think work, a lot of them work closely with universities, which we work with an awful lot as a basis for market entry. The other thing I'd say, I, I should have said earlier, I think in, in defence and maybe in other government areas, there's a concept called offset, where people offset uh, government contracts. And I think, you know, for SMEs and people investing in new projects, um, looking to major defence and major government contracting companies that have offset liabilities is a way of getting people to invest in new technologies and new capabilities. You know, uh, you've all seen the film, you know, Salmon Fishing in the Yemen. Well, we haven't quite done it in the Yemen, but we have done it in the Gulf. And we have done lots of strange things, which involves British companies investing in SMEs to try and to, to try and fulfil some need that a foreign customer thinks they have. So just as a small sort of tangent to the question, I think you know people should look at offset as a valuable source of capital for new projects and new market entries. Okay, one time for one. Can I just make a little okay. comment on that one? Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I think it's very very relevant. Um, <coughs> our one of the constraints on our business. Um, is, is currently not cash, but it is brain power. And we cannot, at the moment, recruit good design engineers, not designers, design engineers, which is quite a difference. Um, we have, uh, and we've got to a point now where, where we just don't take down the advert, and we just, if we find someone, we will recruit them. Um, and we've spent four years looking for a female design engineer. We finally found one, and she studied mechanical engineering and then went to the Royal College of Art. Perfect. Half of our market are women. The auto industry, half of the market are women, and it's just full of blokes. Um, unfortunately, the, the engineer is um, Taiwanese, so we managed to get on a, on a student visa, but then we had real trouble getting the visa extended because, um, obviously, we've got this big clamp down on people coming into the UK. Um, and we've had, that, we, we've had that elsewhere in the business. For me, you know, we, there is a serious problem with, from a manufacturing perspective and an innovation perspective with us cranking this up. They're, they're offering a graduate engineer with a 2-2, 32 grand starting salary in Hinkley. That's a starting salary with a 2-2. I mean, you know, we, it's just getting expensive. And Land Rover, everyone gets excited. They open up a new facility and they just suck out the engineers from the supply chain. And then yeah. the supply chain are up, up, up the creek. So I think there is a problem. And, and at the moment, somehow, we are getting more engineers into the universities, but they tend to be mostly foreign. With the Brits are not, they haven't got it. I mean, so there is some work to be done there. And I do, do see that as a problem. Massive topic, we could be uh, yeah. two hours on that one. one. One last question, then a quick answer. Well, actually, Brian, I'd like to come back to... Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, excuse me, uh, sorry, Brian, I'd like to come sorry. back to a point you made right at the beginning. Um, uh, I am one of these owners of a small manufacturing uh, British SME that does export all over the world. And, uh, and we work very hard. We spend a lot of money uh, in research and uh, technology. We're developing new products. But unfortunately, what's going to hold us back, and this is something Adam probably will, will agree with me about, is that for the last five years, the SME sector has been so starved of access to finance that as the world economy grows, we will not be able to take advantage uh, uh, on the same comparable level as our German counterparts because we've not had the investment uh, to take advantage of the recovery. And, and that is a fundamental problem uh, where we're going to be two steps behind everyone else. And I also I think the other thing is that when we talk to SMEs, rather than we, should, we need to simplify the language. So when you're talking to people with um, small mum and pop firms with less than five people, the message should be, would you like more customers? 
the word export frightens them to death. And it's, it's, a, it's a simple message, and I think, you know, uh, I'll leave that one with you. I'm, I'm going to come to Nick on that one then. Is it, how, how much is a problem is, um, is export finance now? Yeah, I'll come to that, but I, I really agree with that last point about really simplifying the language and talking to SMEs in a language they understand, which is actually one of the reasons we want to work really closely with the Chambers, because you know, a lot of this stuff is not rocket science overseas. You know, it's, it's identifying, uh, you know, the bloke in the Ministry of Labour who's the best person to get you a visa for the person you want to bring in in China. It's, it's, the, it's the, which other SMEs, uh, and talking the language is really important. Yes, um, on, on, on the finance issue, you know, it, it is a real challenge. Um, and you know, the government has tried very hard on this. They've put in a lot of uh, measures which are designed to um, get the banks uh, lending again. Um, on our specific export side, we have our sister organisation, UK Export Finance, which provides products, as you probably know, to ensure and, and, and guarantee uh, various business transactions in a way which is designed to reduce the, uh, or to encourage the bank to lend since they go with a, uh, a bank loan and to reduce the interest rate on that loan. Um, the Chancellor has been putting, uh, you know, significant state assets behind to guarantee loans by banks to small uh, businesses. But we are, finding it, we are finding it really difficult. I mean, on the plus side, what I would say is that because the banks are, um, uh, uh, you know, in, the, in their view, struggling to find the projects that they can lend for, and the SME's view is just not um, lending enough, they, they are very active with us in other areas in terms of trying to help um, on export. I, I mentioned the British Business Centre concept, but, you know, doing joint um, uh, uh, trade missions with other banks, you, for example, with Santander and to um, uh, Latin America, where they have huge expertise, um, getting the banks to market um, the products that we provide. Um, you know, they're very, very active um, in that area. I think it will ca ca come through. I mean, the figures we had this morning about bank lending, I'm you know, less positive perhaps in the, in the small business area, but, you know, the overall positive. So, you know, hopefully we're about to turn the corner on that. Thanks very much. I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope you've got the um, kind of things you want out of it. Please do fill in the feedback form you've got in your little booklet. I'm reminded to tell you that. Um, and do hang around. We've got coffee, we've got croissants, and you can take a look at the famous view over, over the Thames. And um, let me thank all our panellists for what's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much. It was a